So it is a pleasure that, that I introduce uh, Joey and Sherry and Dr. Bob to come and share with us what is a very powerful message and testimony to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On July 10th, a stranger yelled in my front door that there was a guy lying in my front yard. I ran outside to find the seemingly lifeless body of my husband. They administered CPR. The EMTs arrived and eventually transported Joe to the hospital. This was soon followed by two seizures in the ER, a stent being placed in his artery, and four more cardiac arrests within the next 24 hours. His sister, Trish, and I were in the ICU room for one of these events. While 17 doctors and nurses were attempting to resuscitate him, a hospital chaplain and a nurse sat down beside me and told me to let them know when, they wanted, when I wanted them to stop. It took them 13 minutes for his pulse to return. The next attempt that evening at resuscitation took 15 minutes. Joe's family and I prepared for the possibility that he was brain dead. Or if he regained consciousness, he would have some brain damage due to the lack of oxygen throughout all of these events. Joe was intubated for nearly two weeks. He developed pneumonia, contracted MRSA, and other infections, and had internal bleed. His kidneys failed, and he was put on dialysis. Philippians 4 7 says, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And this is what sustained me. I spent a lot of time reading through the book of Job. When things are going well, it's easy to praise God. This is a picture of us, 10 days, without a care of the world, 10 days before his heart attack at a wedding. And this is him 10 days later. So as I said, it's easy to praise God in the good times, but can we praise him in the darkest hours? I read through a lot of Job, and Job 1, 6 through 8 says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where did you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? I kept hearing, have you considered my servant, Job? John 10.10 10 says, the thief, Satan, comes to steal and kill and destroy. But then Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Not knowing if Joe's heart attack would make me his widow, I just continued to pray and thank God for the years he had given us together. <laughs> Pastor uh, Tom was praying today for the folks here in the church. He said that something that uh, uh, said something that uh, made me remind of Joe's miracle. He said there is nothing to God you can't do. He was praying because we pray for people and. Uh, so I wanted to start off with that is that you know, this is all about our Savior and our God and what He can do. Uh, as you know, I'm a family doctor and um, I've been in practice for years. So I've had, I come from this from the viewpoint of having a looking at this from a miracle standpoint. You know, what makes this a miracle? What, what exactly is a miracle? You know, everybody. If you look at the biblical view, um, you know, Jesus did miracles, and um, that's what authenticated him. Um, he said he could do things that nobody else could do. The message, and, um, I 
book by Webster's a dictionary. I was curious what they said the miracle was. So it says a surprising event that is not explained by natural or scientific law and considered work by the divine agency. Now, I think God is in divine agency. I, I thank God for Job and I thank God for this miracle. But, um, a couple of purposes that, of, of miracles is one uh, that will authenticate the character of Jesus and his relationship um, to our Heavenly Father. And the other reason for a miracle is that it authenticates the message about Jesus when he performed the miracle. So I think in today's age, everybody says, oh, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. But um, I think what I'd like to talk a little bit about is why is Job's situation a miracle? And um, you know, from a medical standpoint, when Job was cherry kind of summed up what happened to Job, um, Job initially was found, uh, we expect that he was found five or six minutes by a couple of pastoralized um, walking. And um, you know, they uh, started CPR. Now, the person who was doing CPR had never did CPR before. He actually was taught CPR by his his uh, wife who uh, couldn't do it, she had hurt her back, and she was telling him how to do it. So um, he was trying, they were trying to do everything they could. And uh, so they yelled out for help. And so, you know, it was several minutes before Joe probably even had any attempt to proceed with the arm. So we estimated it was five or six minutes. Normally after four or five minutes, you just stop for brain them. You need oxygen. So, um, <coughs> Joe, Joe was in a bad way initially. And, uh, so uh, after the pastoralists came, they got somebody to stop by and help Joe. Uh, there was a state police woman who drove by, happened to have a, uh, a, uh, a defibrillator in the car. They woke Joe up and they were able to defibrillate him. In the meantime, they continued CPR and the ambulance came and, and they finally took him to the hospital, which uh, you know, took. 15 minutes to get you to the hospital. Um, the, the first miracle is, is that, you know, to survive cardiac arrest outside the hospital, uh, there's 90 to 95 percent of those people don't make it. And uh, so the fact is that, that, you know, somebody found you without cutting the grass. Now, if you haven't been to Nippers, it's like, you know, it's sort of like driving. You know, it's, it's like the uh, city you would say there's not a lot of people. A lot of cars pass by, but not too many people. So for those folks just to find you, it was, it was incredible. And for them to find and start doing something um, is even greater. Uh, so they got Joe to the hospital, and the cardiologist there, um, he, they took him up to the cath lab. And uh, Joe, they found that Joe had suffered a major one artery that they called Widowmaker uh, was about 95% blocked. And when that happens, uh, usually the, uh, the, the death rate goes to 95%. So Joe was, Joe was in a very, very bad way. So we didn't know, one, if he was brain dead, two, if he was, you know, you know, you know from heart standpoint, whether he could survive or not. In that first 24 hours, Joe had four cardiac arrests, so they did CPR four times. And uh, he uh, you know, had like five broken ribs and broken sternum. Uh, the machine that they used, once they get to the hospital, they use this machine that does automatic compressions and compresses your chest out two inches. And, uh, two inches on the chest, something normally got to give. And uh, so was his ribs. So that caused more problems down the road without the type of few minutes. Um, his, uh, when the cardiologist saw the family and said, uh, told us that uh, Joe's heart was only beating, uh, he had a, what we call an ejection fraction, that's how much blood is pushed out of the heart for a contraction. is 15%, almost like 60%. So 50% is not enough really to sustain life. Said he put in a uh, device called a Nutella device, which goes in the heart and pumps the blood out. Um, and, and 
And that's what causes all the problems with the rest. You know, pump the blood out from the oxygen to all the major organs. And that's what causes all the, all the problems. And uh, so uh, they were able to get this device working. And uh, in the meanwhile, the word went out, the prayers went out. We called every church we knew of, every family and friend we had. So we, this, including all our friends here at the church here, um, church, the prayers went out and, um, um, you know, to pray for Jeff and, um, you know, we recovered. And um, so we, um, so we didn't know what was going to happen. We just knew that uh, God was in control and we would just wait for him. Uh, the, um, Joe had been intubated and put a tube down in his throat. Uh, to breathe for him because he wasn't breathing on his own. Uh, about 48 hours later, we were uh, in the ICU um, and uh, after praying, and we had, um, the cardiologist came in and he said, so, you know, we just took your brother upstairs. They, they had a hard time taking Joe upstairs because he was very yeah. unstable. Uh, they'd take him up and work for if he was going to go back into the cardiac arrest if he went in. But uh, they were able to do an echocardiogram, which is where they found sound waves on your heart to look at how well it's contracted. And they said, uh, you know, it's, this is really unusual. He says, uh, I don't know how to explain this, but his heart, his ejection fraction is now 60%. So, so he went from 15% to 60% in, in 48 hours. And um, so, you know, so there was some hope. Now, uh, Joe was laying in bed. You know, he wasn't moving. He uh, had the tooth down in his throat. And uh, the next uh, kind of thing that he overcome was the uh, fact that um, he, neurologically, it appeared like, you know, after five, six minutes of no oxygen, you know, four rounds of CPR, uh, the chances of him waking up was pretty slim. We, uh, Joe wasn't really doing anything to have a heavily sedated. They put him in the hypothermia where they put him Call the whole body down uh, to try to see if they can you know, save the brain cells. And um, so they did that for not quite a day, and then they realized that, that they got, actually got too cold. They had to reheat them up. <laughs> so it's like a, it's like a, a piece of or something. Um, <laughs> but they, they, uh, they, they warmed it back up, and then uh, the following day, Joe started moving his fingers and toes just a little bit. And um, started kind of looking around. So we we were you know, we were really hoping and praying that you know what kind of brain activity would Joe have uh, when he when he woke up or if he woke up. And um, the neurologist came in and ordered an EEG when they hooked up your brain to see if there's any brain waves there. And, um, Joey and Sherry had had a conversation I think a few weeks prior to this uh, about. Um, you know, whether they would um, want to, um, you know, withhold uh, heroic measures. And of course, all this was heroic measures. Joe was in the ICU. I think we kind of had 21 IVs going at one time. Yeah, it was like all lined up. And you may have seen the picture of it. They say the pictures were showing them down. You know, all we knew is that uh, we knew that we believed in God from miracles. And uh, so we were praying the whole time. Poor Joe, but the, the um, neurologist comes in and he, they do the EG and he meets Sherry I, I, out in the hallway. And he, um, you know, he's talking about Joe's brainwaves. He said, he said, well, he said it, it doesn't look great. He said, but there's still some activity in here. He said, sometimes all the medicines we give to sedate them change the brainwaves. And uh, he said, and I still have reasonable hope. And so Joey and I are. Uh, Sherry and I were talking, and I said, you know, reasonable hope to me means that we keep trying. Um, said, um, he said, I, I still think you know, we should do everything. And I know that she struggled with, you know, should she really have Joe with these machines? And he talked about it, and he, they didn't really want to do anything to grow it. So I think, you know, God would be there. And uh, so as we waited, and we just prayed, um, Joe started moving his legs and his arms a little bit more. He started moving his eyes. And then he, one day, he 
opened his eyes up and he started following the man. So we started you know, we're saying, yeah, there's somebody in there. And um, so now, as you can see, there is somebody in there. Uh, God, um, God healed that part of uh, his, um, it was part of his miracle. Uh, the other two things, uh, Joe had, was on a respirator. He was on a respirator for 17 days. And he had a pneumonia called MRSA. MRSA is a very bad uh, bacteria that uh, uh, you know, can cause serious problems and when it's in the in lungs it can cause uh, a death. So um, Joe, Joe and um, over time, um, and you have to remember Joe couldn't breathe that well. He tried to get him off the respirator but, uh, because of his cracked ribs. You have to have uh, more ribs yet broken your, your lungs can't work well. You have to have like a bellows where they can help when the muscles pull on them, they can help bring in air. So Joe was, I think Joe initially had some trouble, but then all of a sudden he seemed to, um, his lungs seemed to do better. Um, his temperature went down. Uh, he started breathing better, and they said, okay, let's pull the tube out. So the big question was, was Joe going to be able to breathe on his own when they pulled the tube out? Could he, yeah, could he maintain uh, that big deep breath that he was taking? And uh, so after they pulled out the tube, um, the first thing that Joe said, I can't tell you everything he said, but the first thing he said was, thank God, because they pulled the tube out. So Joe was waking up, and um, and this was, I think, 17 days later, after all this began. Um, so we, you know, each stage we saw different miracles. And, you know, we knew people were praying for us. So I can't tell you, you know, the power of prayer, the power of never giving up. Just keep, you know, keep praying. Um, the last thing was Joe's kidneys were, were had failed. He was on dialysis to um, help keep his blood clean because of the because of the low blood flow. His kidneys were were failing, so uh, they had to put him on dialysis. Gradually, over the next uh, two two and a half weeks, his kidneys just gradually improved, improved, improved until then, uh, where they was able to uh, take him off dialysis. So Joe sort of had four, um, you know, four miracles, and I, I would say the biggest one that really is his heart, and you know, the fact that he survived all that, and you know, God wants him, you know, wants him here, he still has a plan and a purpose for him. And um, he, um, you know, you never, you know, just, I guess, you know, miracles, um, we all see things, and we all, you know, I think if you're a Christian and you see a miracle, it, it kind of reinforces your faith. Um, if you're not a Christian, then, you know, what do you say? What do you say to that? What do you say to Joe's, um, to Joe's circumstances? Do you say it's luck? Do you say it's, you know, it's, most people just say, well, I don't know what it is, but they should not to me. And, um, you know, we, we believe that, you know, God is here and God helped Joe. Um, Jeremiah 32, 37 says, I am the Lord God, God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? Um, you know, some things can't be explained by science. Um, I, over the years, if, um, I, I remember when I was young, uh, my mother, and Mrs. Weston, uh, used to get out of town to the church to see Catherine Coleman. And uh, many of you may or may not know Catherine Coleman, but she had miracle services down there. I remember going down as a boy. Um, I, I think these miracles throughout my life has sustained my, my faith and my, my relationship with Christ because I know that um, I know that God does these things and this is his way of showing us that he's here and he's real. And hopefully if you're here and you, you know, may have a little bit of doubt, um, I hope that you seek him. He'll, he'll come to you if you seek him. I can't sit down and do this. <laughs> so I'm going to step back here. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. I have to be careful because I will weep. Um, this is our church. It's the church we grew up in. The 
church where so many planted the seeds of faith in my life. I look over at Helen Fry, and I think of Fran Criddleball, Don Bush, and uh, Mrs. Weston, and uh, so many others. Uh, Lori's mom, when I, when I was very young, uh, in Sunday school, teaching us the Word of God. And um, so, had, a, had an impact on me. And as I was praying this morning, getting ready for the service, and, uh, you know, going over some notes, I uh, was thinking along the lines that Bobby was speaking. You know, sometimes God shouts. He shouts that he is here, that he's alive, that he's well. And uh, in my circumstances, God shouted that day. He shouted for everyone around me to hear uh, that he is alive and well. And he still does miracles in this world that we live in. Uh, all of these things that they spoke about today, I, I have no recollection of them at all. Um, literally, I woke up from a deep fog around five weeks after this event happened, and I began putting things together. Last week, I happened to look on my phone, and I saw a message in there that I never read before because there was a bunch of text messages piled up on top of it. And it was about seven days after I had a heart attack, and there was a message there that my wife had sent out to my son, or to her son, telling her that my condition had improved, that I was making these small incremental uh, steps towards well-being. And uh, she didn't tell you half of the story because I was one ill person. I was mean. I had what they call ICU psychosis. I was saying crazy things. Now, for most of you who knew me when I was young, you would say, well, that's Joe. <laughs> but uh, I, I, you know, Bobby characterized things when I woke up and they pulled the tubes out of my mouth a little bit different. And I, you know, he didn't want to go there because the first thing I said was good. I said, thank God. But then I said something and I characterized it. And it shouldn't be said in church. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I was out of it. Can't remember any of these things. And, um, you know, after I got out of the hospital and uh, I was recovering uh, at home, got out of Armour Bill Rehabilitation Center and my wife had started going back to church and I had gotten away from the walker where they had taught me how to walk again. And uh, my pastor came up to me and said, I'm so excited, you know, would, would it be okay with if you shared your testimony in church? And of course, and I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> well, about two or three weeks later, as I thought about this, I'm like, what am I going to say? Because I can't remember anything. I can't remember one of these events that they spoke about today. And that was about four months ago when he came up to me. And really, what he wanted to, me to talk about was, you know, my walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And um, really, that's what it was. And I began, I began to become perplexed about, uh, you know, what I would say. And I was unsure about, you know, what I should share with people. Simply because my recollection of the events which took place in the hours and the days after my heart attack are so sparse. And I only learned about them from the people that were there. See, when I had the heart attack, the day of the heart attack, I didn't have, there was no foreshadowing of the event that, that it was going to happen. I didn't have any heaviness in my chest or any chest pain. I was out cutting the grass and my wife brought dinner out, which she often does if I'm cutting grass in the evening and I've come home from work. And she brought dinner out and I sat on the porch and had dinner, gave her my plates back and went back to work. And I had a very small piece of grass to cut. It wasn't like I was exhausted or feeling tired. 
And I went to cut and I had one little piece of grass left to cut between my sidewalk and the road. And um, Bobby said, I live in a little town. I live in a little town. There's very few people that live there. And that's where I had the heart attack. I didn't have any shortness of breath, uh, no chest pains, as I said. Uh, there were no other physical signs, but that was it. My life was gone. And that's where the story picks up where Sherry said some people pounded on her door. But uh, the events uh, which took place from the time of the heart attack until five or six, six weeks later, they can only be retold by uh, those people who were there and shared in my experience. My presence here today is a miracle. Absent God being directly involved in the matters, my body would certainly be interred somewhere and my spirit would be with the Lord. I'm here today because of the divine providence and foreknowledge of God. The things that happened to me did not catch him by surprise or off guard. The Lord does not slumber, the Bible says, neither does he sleep. The events of that day were purposed by God for his glory and his glory alone. I can truly agree with what the Apostle Paul said from prison to the church in Philippi. See, Paul was in prison and people would look at that and they'd say, man, that's an unfortunate event. That's really bad. He's in prison. But Paul didn't look at it that way. He looked through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. And he said, now I want you to know, believers, that what happened to me, this imprisonment, my being in jail, this was meant to stop me. But it really hasn't done that. It's actually served to advance the spread of the good news regarding salvation. I could say the same thing. I would just characterize it a little bit differently. Now I want you to know, believers, at First Baptist Church, that what has happened to me, this heart attack that was meant to take away my life, has actually served to advance the spread of the good news of salvation. Since regaining consciousness throughout my recovery to my return to the workplace, God has opened up doors everywhere for me to speak of the miracle he performed on my behalf. I remember in early, uh, it, it, right before school started in September, I was still recovering, couldn't walk. I wrote an email to all of the people that I work with. I work with uh, school districts and uh, sent an email out to all of my leaders. And um, I told them what God did for me, how he healed me, how I went through the heart attack, and the four cardiac arrests, and kidney failure. And I sent that out in an email. I didn't know that in the preceding weeks the school started, that as these folks sat down with their membership, they would stand up and they would read the communication that I sent to them. I didn't realize that until I went back to work. And I would walk into a school district and everybody would run up to me and they would say, I've been praying for you, I've been praying for you. They were so happy to see what God had done for me. But since regaining consciousness, uh, you know, I've had many, many opportunities to share what God has done. And it just, it didn't stop, stop after that first week. It, it continues to this day, everywhere I go. I have people coming up, two times this past week, people came up to me that I have not seen, and they, they said, I heard about the miracle that God did for you. People that I didn't even know were believers. The unsaved came up to me. This event which occurred in my life speaks to, to God's might, his power, and his foreknowledge. It demonstrates that he has control over the tiniest details of our lives. From the place I fell, 
to the people who found me lying on the sidewalk and performed CPR, to the doctors and nurses who provided my care. The events were orchestrated by God, and many of you played a part in that miracle. And you'll learn why here in a few minutes. On July 10, 2018, God's church took its place, its rightful place in the world that we live in today. Christians near and far who learned of my plight responded in a godly fashion. They did what Jeremiah the prophet commanded the children of God to do in days of old. Call upon my name and I will show you great and mighty things. Jeremiah 33, 3 says as follows, Call upon me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The church followed the directive of the Savior on that day in Matthew 18, 19. Jesus himself said, And again I say to you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father in heaven. In the weeks that followed the heart attack, as I lay in the hospital and as I worked on recovery and as I went to get dialysis day in and day out, uh, God, I, I cried out to God. I didn't cry out, why did this happen to me? And a oh, woe is Joe. I couldn't understand why I was still here. It would have been a beautiful way, seriously, to go into the presence of the Lord. I felt no pain, there was no anguish, there was not, none of that. But I couldn't understand why I was here. And I was having a very, very difficult time <clears throat> sleeping. I would go to bed at eight o'clock at night, I was exhausted, I would come out of dialysis or the six and a half or seven hours of rehabilitation. I was exhausted, I would fall asleep at eight o'clock and I would wake up at 10. And I would be up from 10 o'clock at night till 4 o'clock in the morning, day after day. I didn't realize it was the medication that they had given me, and I'm thinking, wow, this is not going to be too good if I have to live like this. But uh, I was happy to be alive, and I'm like, oh, you know, why am I here? Why is, you know, why is this happening to me? And um, one morning, I crawled back into bed. The nurses got me back into bed. And I lay down in bed, and I was praying, and the room was completely dark, and I was by myself. Sometimes it helps when you have a brother who's a doctor. I didn't have anybody else in the room with me. And uh, I, uh, I was praying, and it felt like there was darkness all around me. And um, I don't want to sound eerie or spooky or whatever, but it felt like I was in a coffin with the door shut, sealed tight in complete darkness around me. And as I was lying there, I just felt the sense of darkness all around me. And I had been praying this for probably a week or two weeks, you know, like, God, speak to me. Why am I here? And um, sometimes God speaks and he shouts. And this morning when I walked in, I had been praying, you know, about this and about God shouting. And then I got here this morning and I saw the, uh, the bulletin. Everybody look at that. And, uh, you know, it says, declare how much God has done for you. <laughs> Yet, you know, sometimes God shouts. And uh, that certainly confirmed what I was feeling this morning. About God shouting. But as I lay there early that morning, and as I had that feeling of, of darkness all around me, Unexpectedly, at that time period, it was like this brilliant light shined in. And suddenly, everything around me was illuminated. And God spoke these words to me. He said, Joe, you are here because my people prayed. My church prayed. And suddenly, it was as if my eyes were opened and I was given understanding. But God's spirit wasn't finished with me. He spoke to my heart again and he said, if only my people who were called by my name 
would call out for the lost and the dying in this world around us with the same fervency that they cried out for you, I would surely respond. The scriptures teach us that we are God's workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 puts it this way. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Second, 1 Corinthians 3.9 characterizes our role a little bit differently. For we are God's co-workers in God's, in God's service. 1 Peter 2.9 sums it up best. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We, the church, are not called to this heavenly calling to be conformed to this world that we live in and the ways of this world. We are God's ambassadors to a lost and a dying generation who have no hope. And with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, we can be world changers. We must heed God's word as directed in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. This message was not delivered to sinners. This message was delivered to the church of God, to Christians, to people who had a faith in God. Over the weeks and months since this event, God has challenged me personally through the Holy Spirit and by His Word. In particular, He has spoken to me about the sin of unbelief, the sin that I had in my life. How many of us, my wife and I included, because I've shared this with my wife each step of the way, how many times do we go to God in prayer? We take things to God in prayer, and we really don't believe Folks, I have no reason not to believe anything that God has promised me in His Word. Because each and every day, when I walk out of my house, I walk down a set of stairs, and I look in front of me at the place where I lay on the ground dead, and God raised me up. God and God alone. God still does miracles today. In the Gospel of Mark, it speaks about unbelief. And it speaks about what unbelief does to us and can do to us. In chapter 6 of Mark, it talks about Jesus going back to Nazareth, his hometown, where his family was from. And it talks about the fact that Jesus could not do mighty works in his own hometown because of unbelief. In chapter 9, of Mark, it goes into the unbelief theme again. And Jesus is having the mountaintop experience. His other disciples are out and they're sharing the word. They're praying for the sick. And a man came and he brought his son to Jesus. And many of you will remember this story because I remember it. He brings his son to the disciples and he says, pray for my son, he's sick, he's deaf. They prayed for him, but they weren't able to heal him. And just about that time, Jesus came down off the mountain. And he enters the scene. Jesus walks in, and he says to the Father, he says, if you can believe, all, all things are possible to him who believes. And the Father says, he cries out with tears in his eyes. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And then Jesus spoke the word and he healed his son. God is calling us as church 
to be obedient to his calling on our lives. We're supposed to be like King Hezekiah, the king of Judah. When Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came against the people of Israel, they had the city of Jerusalem surrounded with a massive army, multiple hundred thousands of warriors outside the city ready to take it over, and they'd taken over most of the free world. They sent a message to King Hezekiah, and simply they were looking for him to give up, to surrender the people of God. And he sent a letter, and he said, your king is telling you to trust in God for deliverance, but no one has been able to save anyone from me. Sorry about that. The city was surrounded by hundreds of thousands of troops, and it appeared as if there were no hope, similar to where I was at. And the Assyrian commander mocked the living God. He told the people within the walled city, do not let King Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord. When he says the Lord will surely deliver us, the Lord will surely do, deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. <clears throat> Hezekiah took the message from Sennacherib and he went into the church and he laid it down before the Lord. And he prayed and he said, God of heaven, this is what this king has said he was going to do to your city. And that night they prayed and in the morning when they woke up, all that was left outside of the walls of the city was an empty camp with 185,000 slain dead Assyrians because God sent one angel, the angel of the Lord went through the camp and the rest of those who survived fled. God is calling us to do the same thing that Hezekiah did. He's calling us to take the impossible things in our lives, to bring them into his house before his people and to lay them out and to believe that he can do great and mighty things. I'm not special. I'm no special than anyone else in this room. God can do great and mighty things in your life. There are things in each of our lives. Many of you have children you're worried about, you're praying about. Maybe they've walked away from the faith, they're not trusting God. Some have health care issues and difficult circumstances and situations that they have to deal with. But God is crying out, He's shouting to each and every one of us. Call upon Him. And I will answer, and I will show you great and mighty things. And if you have unbelief, there's nothing wrong with admitting and asking God to help us to overcome that sin. Because it's a sin, because our God can do all things. And the scripture teaches us, where two or more are gathered together in my name, if they believe, it shall be done of them what they ask. And so I encourage you, trust in God. Call upon His name because the church is called to repentance and the church is called to reach out with the light to a dark world. Thank you very much.
through the process, but certainly in, in hearing it recounted today. I said last week we, we are a church with prayer warriors. I also said that we are all called. We are all called to be down in the trenches, on our knees, praying to our God. And, and there's a rich history of that in this church. Uh, not surprisingly, um, the Beasley were a big part of that. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to know uh, Joe's dad, but I certainly was blessed greatly by, by their mother, Peg. And I share the story just in closing to, to say that this power of prayer is not something that is foreign to our church. It is a part of who we are, it is a part of our heritage, it is a part of what we are uh, called to do because it's what we've always been called to do. But as I uh, went through one dark evening, and it was really just moments in my life, uh, our first grandson was uh, about to be born, and they came into the room, and, uh, and, and he had gone into a rest, and, and they had like two minutes to get Cameron out of, of my daughter, Rachel's body. And they were rushing her off to uh, the surgery because there were just minutes to save his life. And uh, I recount this story. I had in my phone probably a half a dozen pastors and ministers who I could have called at that moment to, uh, to pray. Instead, I called Pig Beasley who was a prayer warrior for years, and I said, Pay, I need you to pray. And she did. And others did too. But the power of prayer is real. We said it last week. You heard it firsthand today. It's not something that some of you are called to be prayer warriors. Some of you may be more gifted than others, but we're all called to get down in the trenches and be those people who are calling out to him, our God, with the confidence and the knowledge that he hears every one of our prayers and he answers every one of our prayers. And we'll talk more about that next week. Once again, I want to thank the Beasley's for sharing the video. We were so blessed by them. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you that you are just awesome. That you are always faithful. That nothing is too hard, nothing is too big, and nothing is too small to bring before your throne. Because you are our loving Father, our Daddy, and our Abba. And so, Lord God, we thank you and praise you for your love for us, for your devotion to us for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we seek your forgiveness for those times that maybe we have just cried out and, and, and maybe not even really believed. But Lord God, we pray that you would impart on our hearts a faith that transcends all understanding, Lord. That we would be your vessels, your voices crying out, uh, Lord, uh, in prayer for those who are lost, for those who are hurting, for those who are suffering. Lord God, Prepare us and equip us now to be that, that army of prayer warriors that you've called us to be. I pray this in Jesus' name. Good.